Hi guys, and welcome to another physics video. And in this video, we're gonna be having a look at vector equations of lines, planes, and triple products. So we're gonna continue on with our topic of vectors. So let's start off by analyzing what the, equa the vector equation of a line actually is. We know that normally we can define any line on a set of axes. So let's say we've got a set of axes right here. Here's our origin. This is the x-axis and this is the y-axis right here. We can define any line, any line as any lines. Say we have a line like that. We can define any line with the general equation y equals mx plus C. And this is the general form of any line on a set of 2D axes. And what are M and C? We Y and X are obviously any point on the grid, but M right here is the gradient of the line, and C is the Y intercept. The Y intercept. So it's the intersection point. It's the y value in which x is zero, if you like. So when x is zero, you can see that this term just goes and we just end up with here, with c. But how do we incorporate vectors into, into this? How can we represent the same kind of thing, the same line, only in terms of vectors? Well, let's draw out our axes again. So let's draw out our axes. However, uh, this time we're gonna go into three dimensions right here. So we've got an x-axis, got a y-axis going along here, and we've got our z-axis. And let's take two points in 3D space. And let's give them labels, let's call them P1 and P2. Now, these points in space will have an associated position vectors, R1 and R2. And remember what we said, position vectors is a vector from the origin to a particular point in space. And so here are our position vector R1, and this is position vector R2. Again, it's a little bit hard to draw a 3D diagram on in 2D, because uh, of course we're kind of restricted by the sheet of paper, but uh, this is what we're gonna do. Now, these two points will define an infinite line. They will define an infinite line which will span across all of space. And so all you need is two points and you've basically got a line. Uh, you can define a line that just spans off and goes off to infinity. A bit like what we've got right here. But now we've kind of started from two points and we've drawn a line between these two points. Uh, but how do we define this line? Well, we need to know two things about this line right here. Firstly is we need to know the direction of the line, so the way in which this line is pointing, so the exact direction. And we also need to know a reference point on the line. And then we have this unique line right here. Um, with those two pieces of information. So how do we work out the direction of the line to start with? Well, we kind of need a vector that points in the direction of the line. We calculate that by subtracting one position vector from another. So I hope you can see why this is the case. So let's redraw out our just our two position vectors for the two points. So here is our one and here is our two. Now, what is this vector right here? Well, this vector right here is, of course, R2 minus R1. Ooh. And I hope you can kind of see that because R2 is just going from here to here. R1 is going from here. And if we add R1 to R2 minus R1, we simply end up with R2. So this vector right here, R2 minus R1, actually points in the direction of the line. It's actually what we want. We want a vector that points in the direction of the line. So that's good, we have a vector. However, to get to any point along this line right here, we need to multiply this vector by a scalar, and we usually denote the scalar 
by lambda. And lambda is just any number. It's a number that you have to multiply r2 minus r1 by in order to get to any particular point you want along the line. And of course, lambda can be negative, And if it is negative, rather than going that way, you're just simply going to go that way right here. So let's do a quick example to see how this works. So let's say we know we have two points. We have P1 and we have P2. And we want to find the vector equation of the line that defi that is, that's defined by these two points. So here's our points, and point one is at position three, six, two, and point two is at position four, nine, four. So those are our two points right there. So firstly, we have to convert these two points, these two coordinates, into position vectors. And that's pretty easy. We, we can easily see that r1 is 3x hat plus 6y hat plus 2z hat. And r2 is, of course, 4x hat plus 9y hat plus 4z hat. So now we have to subtract r1 away from r2, and that will give us the vector that joins those two points together. And so that will be our direction vector, uh, which, was, which we're going to use to define the line. So what's R2 minus R1? Well, R2 minus R1, of course, we just subtract that one away from that one. So we're going to end up with X hat plus 3Y hat plus 2Z hat. Now, of course, you could convert this into a unit vector. And that's a kind of a more elegant thing to do right here. So let's just do it for completeness. You don't actually have to, because of course, all that's going to happen is that the scalar is going to be slightly different if you, um, the scalar is going to be slightly different. But as long as it has this, this, these kind of proportions, then this will correctly define any point along the line. But for completeness, let's just go and work out the, uh, magnitude of r2 minus r1 and that is of course just square root of 1 squared plus 3 squared plus 2 squared and that is just square root of 14. So our direction vector, our unit direction vector will be 1 over root 14 um, into x hat plus 3y hat plus 2z hat. So that is our kind of unit direction vector. But of course, we need a starting point as well. Obviously, you'll have an infinite number of lines which point in that particular direction, but we need to choose one particular point, and we only need one particular point and then, uh, to reference, and then we've defined the line. Now, it doesn't actually matter uh, which point you choose. We know two points along the line that we're trying to define. We know P1 and P2. So let's just go ahead and select P1. And so, of course, P1 has position vector R1, which is, of course, 3x hat plus 6y hat plus 2z hat. So that's our known point along this line we're trying to define. Now, of course, you could have selected this one just as easily. Um, but all that would have happened is you'd have had a different value for this scalar lambda. It would just be different, basically. So let's write our final equation, our general equation for any point along the line. So R, our position vector for any point, is our known point, which is 3x hat plus 6y hat plus 2z hat. And just put that in brackets. Plus any scalar lambda. Just, that's just an ordinary number, lambda. And we're going in the direction of x hat plus 3y hat plus 2z hat. And of course, you could divide that by root 14. And then this term here, that term there, will just be the unit vector pointing in that direction. So there we go. We've defined our line. So you'd be able to work out any point along that line by knowing a known point, which is this term here, and the direction in which the line goes, multiplied by this term here, which is, of course, this whole term right here.
Now we come along to planes. And firstly, what is a plane exactly? Well, a plane is basically any sort of infinitely flat surface that spans across the whole of space. So you can kind of imagine it a little bit like a sheet of paper, but instead of the edges of the sheet of paper ending like they do over here, they, they go on forever. It's an infinitely flat sheet of paper. Um, and you can typically regard this, this bit of paper I'm writing on right here as a kind of a flat plane. So it's basically like an infinitely thin and flat surface. Normally to represent a plane, we just draw a small section of the plane. Now mathematically, how do we define a plane exactly? Well, what we have to notice is that all planes have a normal vector associated with it that points out of the plane. So say we take this the sheet of paper I'm writing on, you can see that the normal to this plane, the perpendicular vector that points out of the plane is this right here. It's a vector that points out of the plane. And so if this was the plane right here, then our normal vector will be pointing that way. And if it, or if it was say this one right here, this plane would have a normal vector pointing that way. So we can see that all planes have a normal vector associated with them. So let's draw out uh, a plane and we'll draw out a little diagram of a plane. And then we can start to do some mathematical manipulation with planes. So here are our three axes. Again, we've got our X axis, we've got our Y axis, and we've got our Z axis. And let's go ahead and draw a part of a part of the plane. I'm going to use a red pen for this right here. So let's just draw part of the plane that we're going to try and describe. So here it is. Here's our part of our infinitely flat sheet of surface. I'm going to colour it in red so we know what we're talking about. And we know that the plane has a normal vector that is associated with it. And this vector points out of the plane. Now we can start to draw this, this normal vector from the origin to the plane. Uh, so if we draw a vector that goes from the origin to the plane, and of course this vector is tangential to the surface of the plane. It's a little bit hard to draw in 2D, but I hope you can kind of see what's happening. You've got a, a vector that starts from the origin and is hitting the plane at a, at a particular point such that the vector and the plane are normal. And we normally denote the normal vector with capital N. If it's going from the origin, then we normally use capital N for the normal vector. Now let's also take uh, another vector R. Now vector R is just our good old fashioned position vector that we know, and it goes from the, nor from the origin and it ends on the plane right here. So it's a position vector for any point on the plane. Now, what can we say? Well, we can see that the projection of R onto N must be equal in magnitude to N squared, as you can see. So if we, if here's our little angle right here, we can see that if we, if we project R onto N, it will just be the length of n, won't it? Because and that will and that will be the case for any r that's on the plane. The projection of r onto the normal will always be just the length of the length of the normal here. So, what can we say about that? Well, we can say that r dotted with n is just n squared. As we said that the dot product was the projection of r onto n multiplied by the length of n, so r dot n is just n squared. Now we can write r and n in terms of their individual components. So r, our position vector, uh, we know is x in the x hat plus y in the y hat plus z in the z hat. So that's our general position vector. Uh, and n, well, let's say that n has an x component a y component and a z component. So those are just the different components. If we use this formula right here and dot, and dot r and n, then we can see that nx x plus 
nyy plus nzz is equal to n squared. And that is the general form of the Cartesian equation of a plane. Now, one thing you'll notice is that the dot product with any vector that lies in the plane is just zero. So let's say we have a vector that's in the plane. It starts in the plane and it ends in the plane. So it's, just, it's stuck, it's trapped in the, in the plane. And let's just call it A for now. And say we have another vector, another vector B in the, in the plane. Now you notice that the, with both of these vectors, if you dot A with the normal vector, then you will just get zero because of course this, this vector lies in the plane and this vector is 90 degrees to the plane. And of course the dot product between two vectors that are at 90 degrees is just zero. And of course, that will be the case with vector B as well. So take any vector that's in the plane, uh, that starts in the plane and ends in the plane and dot it with the normal vector, you're always going to get zero. But what happens if we don't have a normal vector that ends on its surface? So of course, n right here I've shown starts from the origin and ends on the surface. What happens if that isn't the case? and we have just some, it, we have a vector that points normally to the plane, uh, but it doesn't end on the surface, and we can just call that vector n. Well, rather than having r dot n is n squared, we're just going to get that r dotted with n, this time it's lowercase n, we're just going to be some number. Well, we're just can, we can just call it gamma, so it's just some arbitrary number. So let's do an example to see what's happening. So let's say that we have a plane and we know the normal vector ends on its surface. So it's this case right here. It start, the normal vector to the plane starts on, from the origin and ends on the surface. And this normal vector, capital N, is given by 2x hat minus 3y hat plus z hat. So what's the equation of the plane? Well, we know that because it ends on its surface, then we know that r dotted with n is n squared. And I'll make a little note that it ends on the surface. This is only the case for when the normal vector ends on its surface. So if we dot r with n, well, what are we going to get? We're going to get 2x plus, sorry, minus, 3y plus 1z equals n squared. Well, what's uh, what's the vector, what's the modulus squared? Well, it's going to be the square root of 2 squared plus 3 squared plus 1 squared, all squared. And that, when you evaluate it, is 2x minus 3y plus z is just 14. And that is the equation of the plane. That's our Cartesian equation of the plane. But what if this normal vector only lies in the direction of, two, of, of this right here, but does not end in the surface? What, what's going to happen then? Well, if, if that's the case, then we're actually going to be defining a family of planes right here. So we know, the, we know that all these planes have exactly the same normal vector. They're all, they're all, gonna, all the normals to, this, to all of these planes are all pointing that way. But as you can see, which plane is it? We don't know. There are too many different options. They all point the same direction, but we have a, we've actually defined a whole family of planes. And of course, the general formula is 2x minus 3y plus z is gamma. We don't know we don't know what this gamma is and so therefore we've ended up defining an infinite number of planes. However, if we are given a particular point in Cartesian space, then we can actually work out what gamma is. So let's just take the point P, which is 3 minus 1, 2, just for example. So we know that the position vector r is 3x hat minus y hat, 3, yeah, 3x hat 
minus y hat plus 2z hat. And if we substitute these values into the equation for the plane, we're going to end up with 2 times 3 minus 3 times minus 1 plus 2 times 1. And what are we going to end up with here? That's going to be 6 plus 3 plus 2, which is 11. So we know that gamma in this case is 11. And so now we have a specific plane. We've defined a specific plane because we know a point that this plane passes through. So this is how to work out the equation of a plane given a point and given the normal vector. Now onto the final bit about planes. What happens when we have a line intersecting with a plane? Well, let's go ahead and just draw it out. Draw it out quite quickly. It's funny because planes are one of these things that are quite hard to visualize without really drawing it out. Um, but if you if you understand the maths behind it, if you understand that you know we're just it's just substituting numbers in, then you should be all right. But uh, so let's say we have a plane, and here's our plane. It's going to be a bit of a wonky plane this time. But there's our plane, and this is z, y, and x, of course. And here's our origin. And let's say we have a line that's going to be intersecting the plane at a certain point right here. And the question I want to ask ourselves is, where is this point? How do you work out what the point is of intersection between the line and the plane? Well, we know that the equation for a line, the vector equation of a line, is given by r equals a, which is the known point on the line, plus any scalar or known position vector corresponding to a point, plus any scalar lambda times b, which is the direction in which the line points in. Uh, so that's the equation for a line. What about a plane? Well, we know that the general vector equation of a plane, r dotted with n, is gamma. We can substitute this equation into this equation, and we can actually work out what lambda is. So if we substitute, we're going to get a plus lambda b dotted with n equals gamma. And so if we expand this dot product out, remember dot product is basically just the multiplication. So what we can actually do is we can just say that a dotted with n plus, that should be a vector right there, lambda times b dotted with n equals gamma. And now if we rearrange for lambda, we can find that lambda equals gamma minus a dotted with n, all divided by b dotted with n. And that is how you work out what lambda is. And from that, you can work out what r is. So it's basically you've got two equations and two unknowns. And from that, you can work out the position on, you can work out the point in which the line intercepts with the plane. And that is a basic introduction to planes. And finally, in this video, I want to talk about triple products, and in particular, the scalar triple product and the vector triple product. Now, a triple product is basically just a combination of the dot and the cross product. And the scalar triple product is the product of three vectors, and it occurs quite often in physics. So how do we define the triple product? Well, we say that D, uh, which is a scalar, I shouldn't have drawn a vector arrow, D is a scalar, is equal to A dotted with B crossed with C. So as you can see, you take two vectors, you cross them and then you dot that with another vector and then you end up with a scalar. So it's basically just combining the two, the two operations that we've learned. Now, how do we interpret the result of the triple product? Well, the magnitude of that scalar represents the volume 
of the parallel piped that the three vo vectors will span out. So let's draw out what I mean by that. So let's draw out our three vectors. So we have, this is vector A, this is vector B, and this is vector C right here. Now I said with the cross product, the two vectors span out a parallelogram. Um, but if, if you've got three vectors, you're gonna end up in the third dimension. And so you're gonna end up spanning out a 3D parallelogram, which is called a parallelopiped. And so this is the parallelopiped that the three vectors will span out. And the volume of this parallelopiped is given by D, this scalar right here. So let's do an example of how we work out the triple product. It's actually very similar to working out the cross product, except we'll make one small change to the determinant of the matrix. So let's define three vectors. So let's say that A is minus two X hat plus three Y hat plus four Z hat. That's our first vector. Vector B is just four Y hat. And vector C is minus x hat plus three y hat plus three z hat. So how do we work out the triple product of these of these three? Well, well, we draw out our determinant a bit similar to how we worked out the cross product, um, but instead of writing the unit vectors along here, we actually just write out all of the we actually just write out the components of the vector A. So we write out minus two, three, four, just as we would with the other two vectors as if we're gonna cross them. And we're gonna write out our components of B, which is nothing in the X hat, four in the Y hat, nothing in the Z hat. And our components of C on the bottom row, we've got minus one, three, and three. And the triple product is just evaluating this, a question of evaluating this determinant right here. So let's go ahead and do that. So what are we gonna get? Well, we're gonna get minus two multiplied by the mini determinant, the mini two by two determinant, uh, which is just four, zero, three, three. And we're gonna minus that. Remember for this one right here, we minus the for this one right here, we minus the term that's formed. So we get minus three multiplied by the, this little matrix here. Remember what we do, we delete all of the elements that are in the same row in the same column, and that forms our mini determinant. So that's naught, naught, minus one, three. And then we plus four, and then what's our little mini determinant gonna be? It's gonna be, naught, four, minus one, three. So let's go ahead and evaluate all this. We're gonna get minus two multiplied by four times three minus zero times three. Four times three is 12. Mi minus two times 12 is minus 24. And what's this next term gonna be? It's gonna be three times naught times three minus naught times minus one. Well. Both of those, that's all gonna be zero, therefore that whole term is zero. And lastly, what are we gonna get? We're gonna get four times, zero times three is zero, minus four times minus one, which is plus four, because we're gonna have minus minus four, multiplied by the four, which is 16. So what are we gonna get? We're gonna get minus 24 minus zero plus 16, and that totals to minus eight. And that minus eight represents the volume of the parallelopiped. Okay, you're probably wondering, hey, how come we've got a negative volume? Um, that is only because of the direction, remember. Physically, the parallelopiped will have a volume of eight cubic units, but I think just because of the direction in which these vectors happen to be, we ended up getting minus eight but that's neither here or there. Another thing to note is that you can actually rewrite the triple product by actually just shuffling the vectors about. So remember I said that D is A dot B cross C. 
So we can actually say, we can actually rewrite that as B dotted with C crossed with A. And we can also write that as C dotted with A crossed with B. Now you see what I've done is I've actually changed the order but in a kind of a cyclical way. So if we have our three vectors, I'm just going to kind of describe what I'm doing a little bit right here. So if we go A, B and C, if we shuffle around them, if we shuffle them around in this order, then we can actually use any of these three forms and still end up with the same triple product. And the last thing about the scalar triple product that I want to say is that the triple product can be used to, as a check to see if three vectors lie in the same plane. So what do I mean by that? Well, let's say we've got our three vectors. So here's vector A, here's vector B, and here's vector C. And let's draw out a, a plane in which all of these vectors are in the same plane. So let's see if we can try and draw out a little plane. Hopefully you, you guys can see that all three of these vectors, they all lie in this green plane right here. So what happens when we do the triple product of these three vectors? Well, B crossed with C is going to give us a vector that points normal to the plane, because of course, B and C both lie in the plane, and if you take the cross product with, so there's our vector B cross C, if we take the cross product, okay, it's gonna be the other way around, but um, if we take the cross product between these two vectors, then we're gonna end up with a vector that's normal to the plane. But what happens when we dot that vector with vector A right here? Because vector A is in the plane as well. Well, that, is, that angle there is just 90 degrees. And the dot product of two perpendicular vectors is just zero. So we can see that A dot B cross C is zero if all the vectors lie in the plane. And that's kind of a little check that you can do to see if three vectors all lie in, in the plane. And if they do all lie in the plane, they're said to be coplanar. And finally in this video, I want to have a look at the vector triple product. And the vector triple product is very similar to the scalar triple product, except for the result, you actually get a vector rather than a scalar. And instead of this operation being a dot product, you have A crossed with B crossed C. So you basically just do the cross product twice. So you, you cross these two vectors and then you take that cross product with another vector. And of course the result being a cross product rather than a dot product is going to be a vector rather than a scalar. Now I'm not gonna prove this identity but there is a useful vector identity associated with uh, the vector triple product. And it's kind of known as the back cab rule. And you'll see why it's known as the back cab rule when I write it out. So the vector identity states that A crossed with B crossed with C is one and the same as B, the vector B multiplied by the scalar A dot C minus c, vector c, multiplied by a dotted with b. So you can see that a dot c, that's just going to give a scalar, but when you multiply that by a vector, this whole term is a vector right here. And a similar argument applies for this term, a dot b is a scalar, multiplied by c is going to give you a vector, so that term's a vector, that term is a vector, you subtract two vectors, you're going to end up with a vector. So this is basically a kind of a nice handy way of having to avoid doing a cross product, really, if you, because you'd much rather do a dot product than a cross product, let's face it, guys. So um, this is a handy vector identity. You'll probably not find yourself using it too much, but it's a handy identity to have. So that pretty much wraps up everything I want to cover in this video. I hope you guys found it useful and helpful. 
And in the next video, we're going to be starting to look at some proper physics and kinematics. And so I'll see you guys then.